I'd like you all to use your imagination and come with me on a short journey back in time. Like, <laughs> A little, a little over 10 years ago, I was an alcoholic and a crack cocaine addict. Chaska, Minnesota, the town he grew up in, a place where he launched one half-baked business idea after another, cleaning carpets, raising pigs, running lunch wagons, and occasionally making money as a professional card counter. They came around the table and picked me up and literally threw me through the front door. <laughs> like, uh, and I owed the mafia money, $20,000. They came to break my arms. Uh, for football bets. I had, uh, when I was 17, I got like 18 tickets on a, on a motorcycle in two days out running the cops. <laughs> so we're doing a reaction video to Mike Lindell, my pillow CEO. Also, I love like 18 tickets. I, I, after the first two to three, don't they just arrest you? <laughs> um, you know, I went to go skydiving, fell asleep on that motorcycle, crashed it, was bound and determined to finish, you know, it was all banged up and bound and determined to get down to Stanton, Minnesota and, and finish this uh, skydiving jump. It was my ninth jump and my parachute didn't open. I had a streamer hit the ground and like <laughs> about 1982 or 83, um, you know, I did different things. I then I was became a card counter, a professional card counter. Uh, my uncle, I worked on his farm raising pigs. I guess that was the last job I had for someone. And I decided, well, I'm going to raise pigs myself. And I and why am I working for him? So I went and bought all these feeder pigs, put them in a semi-residential area, and uh, uh, the bottom fell out of the market. That was a disaster. So, but they, um, I, but I tried all these entrepreneurial things on the same parallel track. But during that time, I ended up get, I married the girl of my dreams. I had uh, four kids, a very functioning addict. <laughs> Most of your addicts, I hate to say it, are functioning. They're in the corporate world. They're in the the, you know. In the 80s, Lindell got into the bar business. Probably wasn't real good because I was an addict at the time, pretty hardcore cocaine addict. I owned a bar for 13 years. After the bar would close, and my friends would all tell you that, we'd go back afterwards and sit and do cocaine and stuff, and I'd be telling them, hey, these drugs are bad, and I was telling them about end times and revelation in the Bible I read about in jail, and, and they would quit that day and find Jesus, and then I'd wake up and go, I'm losing friends, what do I say? You know, I, I didn't really know, but that was me wanting to convince myself. A lot of the way I, that I function is I'll, I'll be talking to people and wanting what, they, what I'm telling them, I, you know what I mean? So I'm trying almost to convince myself. But. Okay, so I had to sell the bar in 2003, and that was, a, that was a circumstance beyond my control, but it was going down anyway. It was going down the backside with the crack. I'm like, <laughs> Then in 2004, he dreamed of a pillow which would hold its shape. The, the, with my pillow, that came in a dream right from God. I mean, that was a divine dream, and and I dreamt of the, the, my, the name My Pillow first. There weren't many Mys then. I might have been the first. I don't know. And I I wrote My Pillow all over the house. And then when I got up in the middle of the night, it was about two in the morning, and I had My Pillow wrote everywhere in the kitchen and all over the house. And my, my daughter, one of my daughters at the time, she came upstairs. She goes. She looked around, she goes, what are you doing, Dad? It's about 2 in the morning. She's like 11, 12 years old. She goes, what are you doing? And I said, I'm going to invent this pillow. It's going to be called my pillow. What do you think of the name? It's going to change but millions of people. It's going to be the most, the biggest thing ever. And uh, I didn't even know what was going to be in it yet. <laughs> she, she grabs a glass of water and she goes, that's really random, Dad. <laughs> but then I just, huh. I went all in. I was just like, I kept getting these dreams and, you know. <laughs> This guy has a dream from God, and his response is to write my pillow over all of Well, like, you can't write it down just once. <laughs> and then I, I got into crack cocaine. It's a different drug. Lindell lost his marriage, his house, and almost his business. During the, um, um, during the, or the 2000, I was a crack cocaine, or a cocaine addict in 2000, or, um, or let's, see, let's see, 1984 when I first did cocaine. And that was that fear of, of rejection and stuff. And I did that. And then that changed to, I had a, so I was a functioning cocaine addict, but it changed to crack in the early 2000s. And, and during the time of my pillow, when I, from the time I invented, I ended up getting a, a divorce of 20 years and there was people trying to take the company, all these things, but so much of my own adversity too. By the way, you were addicted to crack cocaine at the same time you were running a company. How is that yeah. possible? <laughs> yeah, that, well, that's the miracle. With God, all things are possible. I, uh... So the moral of this guy's story is all things are possible with God, including running a business and drugs. You yeah. can have it all. You, you really can, can have, have it, it all. all. 
I invented the pillow in 2004, and uh, people ask me all the time, and you didn't quit till uh, 2009, and they go, how is that possible? And I went down to the, a local, it was a Bed Bath & Beyond, and, and I went, went in there first, I said, I have the best pillow in the world, how many would you like? And they're going, okay, I mean, you need to leave. <laughs> yeah, you know, you know. That's really random. But I was turned down everywhere. I was turned down. It was a complete shutout. And someone said, well, Mike, why don't you do a kiosk? I said, well, how do you spell that? And uh, I didn't know what a kiosk was. And Someone said, Mike, why don't you do a kiosk? I said, how do you spell that? <laughs> I ended up doing uh, a kiosk. Someone said, Mike, why don't you do a kiosk? I said, how do you spell that? <laughs> and, uh, we, we did this kiosk, and that kind of failed. We did this uh, kiosk and uh, completely out of money, borrowed money to do the kiosk. But that, uh, but then I did shows and fairs for for years. And uh, but I, you know, during that time, I was also a crack cocaine addict, and a lot of a lot of things happened. In 2008, after being up for more than two weeks straight on crack, Lindell's dealer put the word out on the street that no one should sell him drugs until he slept. That's really random. Drug dealers did an intervention. That was kind of a. A big uh, thing I had. Now, why would drug dealers do an intervention? Well, you can't afford to lose your best customer. <laughs> yeah. Long term strategy is how <laughs> drug dealers care about who they deal to. Well, here's what happened. They, uh, I was up 14 days and I was living, staying downtown in Minneapolis and a half hour from where I was making uh, or doing pillows in this little schoolhouse. And but I had a warrant out for my arrest and I was gonna be found innocent the following Tuesday. So I was hiding out down there and <clears throat> I come out of the room and three, three of the biggest dealers, I didn't even know they knew each other. And they said, what are you guys doing? And the one guy goes, Mike's been up for 14 days, we're shutting him off. And, and the, guy, the one guy goes, he looks at me like, what's the matter with you? And he says, you ain't getting anything from my guys. And, and I said, what are you, just an intervention? The guy goes, call it whatever you want. Um, yeah, they, they all like me, but here's what they said. You know, I, I was a good customer too. <laughs> well, two of them left, and I said, and they said, how much you got left? I showed him how much rocks it. He sat down to make sure that I did it, went to bed, wouldn't get any more. Well, he finally fell asleep right about the time I was running out and I was tweaking it, looking on the floor for carpet, we call it farming, looking for crack. He was but never his crack there. And now I looked over and the, the, uh, this dealer, dealer, he finally went to sleep. I ran out of crack and I'm doing one of these numbers and I headed down to the streets in Minneapolis about 2.30 in the morning. Couldn't get drugs anywhere and I went out. I was very resourceful, nothing. You know, they had threatened anyone on the street. If you sell to them, we're gonna kill you, well, who knows? I'm not kidding. I could not, nobody. And I'm going, I have $100 for $5 worth. And these are addicts on the street. These are, you know, and then I'm going, okay, how could they get the word out? How do they know, you know, notice me? I'm trying to hide my mustache and everything. <laughs> okay, you know. Wait, wait, do we like believe this story? I mean, I don't. Okay. <laughs> okay. This is something that people are like, this seems like a reasonable story. I, I, like the idea that in the entire city, nobody would sell to him. Yeah, crack dealers are going to threaten people's lives for this guy. You know, and I get back to the to the apartment and he's sitting there and he goes, and he's sitting there, he goes, how'd that work out for you? And, I, and I'm just all upset and he goes, give me your phone, he said, uh, and uh, he says, I wanna, I'm gonna take a picture. He says, you're gonna need it for that book you've been bragging about, telling us you're gonna write. And he said, you've been telling us for years this my pillow is just a platform for God and you're gonna come back someday and help us out of this addiction and all the dealings that we have. And he says, we're not gonna let you die on us. I was their hope, because I told wow. them that all the time. Because I would always tell these guys all the time, you guys, this pillow is just a platform for God. That this pillow was just a platform for God. That's really random. <laughs> So, so the whole crack dealing community needs to keep him alive because, because he's, he's going. Their hope. So wait, he thinks he's like Jesus. Essentially, <laughs> yeah. they thought I was their hope because I told them that all the time. <laughs> then about six months later, my one son, he uh, we had came back from a hunting trip and he was in the driveway, and he says, "Dad, I can't stay here anymore. I'm gonna I want to live with my brother." He's got a tear in his lips are quivering and he's and I and that hit home to me. I'm going, I'm not I'm not hiding too much from him. And uh, he, he must have known you were addicted. Yeah. At that, you know, when they when the kids were 
uh, from 16 down, they don't remember. They, they, you know, my daughter said one time, she says, you know, we're a very dysfunctional family. I said, that was towards the end. And I said, I don't know what that means, but don't say that again. That sounds horrible. <laughs> so he doesn't know what a kiosk is. He doesn't know what dysfunctional means. Like, did this dude go to school? <laughs> and two days later, I had to deliver papers to my brother and take a chance of getting arrested uh, is a half hour out to where we were running our business, our company out of a little schoolhouse, one room, and I had to get these papers to him or or my pillow wouldn't even be here. Well, so I took a chance after I slept for two days, I drove out there. Sure enough, Larry, the town cop, passed me as I was pulling into the parking lot, and he goes, Mike, stop right there. And I said, Larry, I said, I know you're going to arrest me anyway, but I said, if these papers don't get to my brother, I said, something to do with the future and God. I said, millions of people are going to get affected if you don't let me deliver these papers. And I said, I know you're going to arrest me anyway, but next Tuesday I'll be found innocent. And if I'm not, you can arrest me anytime, and I promise I'll have cocaine on me. I, I don't understand how the judicial system works in this town. I don't. With the town cop. <laughs> you know that if you're a white guy with a mustache, you can simply tell the cops that you have very important errands to run. And, so please don't arrest And me. I'm going to be found innocent. Like, <laughs> look at me. Anyway. Look at this. Look at this. I'm clearly innocent. <laughs> I didn't quit then, but, but it, was, it was actually seven months later where my friend came to me. Now, I had lost everything. I was all by myself in this house. And... And, uh, and here uh, he came to me and I had heard, he was my equal. 20 years earlier we had started cocaine together, then we had switched to crack together. But he had found the Lord and been, and been freed of it three years earlier, that's what I had heard. Now I hadn't talked to him in a year, and here he came walking in, I said, Dick, what are you doing? And he goes, the Lord led me here. He said, what's going on? And I said, well, as long as you're here, I said, I got a lot of questions for you. I said, is it boring? He said, no, man, it ain't boring. And I just prayed. I said, I want to be freed of these addictions and desires and for all the, and uh, the next morning I woke up and whoa, whoa, whoa. But then things started happening that these miracles, I needed, these guys had taken the company and took all my shows and I needed $30,000. I needed it to... And uh, I met these guys, uh, or I met this guy. This is a, this is a story I tell all the time. They, this guy said, oh, I have some guys that will take chance and borrow money or whatever. And I talked to him a couple weeks earlier. And so they, <clears throat> I meant to meet him. I needed the money in the afternoon with 30 grand. And I was walking in there with a T-shirt. And here I walk in. And there's a, I don't know these guys from Adam. Here's a CIO, a CIEIO, a CFO. They're all wearing suits. I'm scared to death. I go in there with a pillow. And I go, hey, you guys, I want to borrow 30 grand. I'll pay you back 40 grand within two months. I'm going to set up shows. I'm going to have the biggest, it's going to be the biggest company in the world someday. Uh, these guys took my company. I used to be a crack cocaine addict. And one of the guys said, the CFO, I think, goes, well, we need to quit crack. And I said, last Thursday. <laughs> and literally, four ah. of them got up and left the room. It's like Shark Tank. For that reason, we're out. Yeah. And, and the other four ended up giving me the money. And wow. I just, well, they got, you know, they got zapped and I didn't even have it. They didn't even, you know, there was no, they never checked my ID because I knew that because I didn't have a driver's license. So I walked out of there with the cash, ended up paying them back. But things like that kept happening for the next two years. I had things that only you, could, you go the, in the book. It's like, what are the odds? When you have a one in a million happen, a one in a billion, or this, this is, you push this off just to chance. When you add them up in your own lives, when does it become a miracle? For me, I use mathematical odds that God has to be real because it would, all the stuff that happened to me was impossible. Whoa! What mathematical is this guy odds. Rambling about. What this, in the world? I don't see. You don't see the proof that God clearly exists. I don't from see, I see the proof that our mental health system is a failure. <laughs> this guy is loony, and like people gave him money. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. And without ID. <laughs> <laughs> I got up to when I did that, I said, my friends and family, we had no money left again. And I said, you guys, if we all put in money, I want, I give a dream of the biggest infomercial ever. If no box store is going to take us, nobody's going to take us. But for every two steps forward, there's always been one step back. 
after annual sales went from $100,000 to nearly $300 million in a dozen years, California authorities started accusing the company of making unsubstantiated health claims. The BBB revoked its A-plus rating because Lindell was running specials year-round. My pillow advertised the buy one, get one free, or as we call it, the BOGO offer, but they did it continuously. And that violates not only the Better Business Bureau's rules, but it also violates the Federal Trade Commission's rules. According to BBB rules, which mimic Federal Trade Commission rules, an item cannot be on sale longer than it is marked regular price in a given year. We approach the company as we always do when we see a violation. They said that they didn't really understand that that was a problem but that they couldn't change it at that time. Why not? They felt that it would be too distressful for, the, for their company. We like to change it up, but this was so successful, we ran it longer than we, than we would normally run. Now MyPillow's BBB accreditation has been revoked. As of tonight, the two-for-one pillow special still exists and is being advertised on MyPillow's website. Why is it still up there today? I mean, you got, you got your rating downscored from an A-plus to an F, but it's still on your website. You can't, right, because that's where my media, they have to find the square. I, our ads on TV, I have my, this is for my customers, so they know where, where to pick the square so they're not confused. Lindell said he believes his pricing is fair, and he didn't pull down the promotion because he already paid for spots advertising that sale. You can't just stop everything. I've committed to, to media from around the country, too, where I've prepaid, you know, for media and paid for my spots. So, you know, you can't... Uh, you know. But it's not the only complaint. In October, the company settled a case with district attorneys in California who sued the company over its claims that the pillows could help with conditions including fibromyalgia and sleep apnea. While admitting no fault, my pillow settled and agreed to pay over $1 million in penalties. On top of the BBB's F rating and a $1 million settlement in a civil case in California alleging false advertising, MyPillow was also being sued in Oregon for allegedly misleading customers with its BOGO offer. He blames a lot of this on politics. Were you punished for supporting Donald Trump? Absolutely. And we will stand up for our companies, our factories, and our workers. Is that okay with you, Michael? Good. <laughs> Mike Lindell met Donald Trump in 2016 and quickly became a fan. Whoa!